Well, hello, and thank you for joining us again this week here at First Baptist Church Hesperia. Grateful for the opportunity to share with you and uh, worship with you together. I want to start our time together by reading from Psalm 16. David says, Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have nothing good besides you. As for the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones. All my delight is in them. The sorrows of those who take another God for themselves will multiply. I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood, and I will not speak their names with my lips. Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who counsels me, even at night when my thoughts trouble me. I always let the Lord guide me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My body also rests securely, for you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me, and your presence is abundant joy, and at your right hand are eternal pleasures. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time to gather. I pray for everybody who is participating with this today and watching, wherever they may be watching. I pray your blessings upon their lives, the lives of their family. I pray that you minister to them with the power of your strength, of your spirit. Comfort them, provide for them, protect them. And bless this time together in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hello everyone, here are the three giving options for the First Baptist Church of Hesperia. You can go to our website at fbch.org and choose Give at the right side of the menu. On the Give page, enter the amount you wish to give and choose if it is a one-time or a recurring give and press Next. You will then be asked to enter and confirm a phone number to continue to the payment page. You can also text FPC Hesperia to 77977 to receive a link to the same payment page. Another option is by cash or check. Please mail checks to 9280 Maple Avenue, Hesperia, California 92345. Thank you for your giving faithfulness. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to call the church. My name is Roxy, and I'm a youth teacher in the youth ministry. We have some announcements to get to. Um, in Spanish ministry, is hosting a mission fundraiser to send members to Peru this June. Enjoy pupusas and donate on Sunday, March 6, after the 10:15 a.m. and 12:30 p.m. services. Scan the QR code on your bulletin, or click the link on the app to pre-order now. Ladies. A spring retreat is coming up and we're headed to Victory Ranch. Dates for this are March 11th through March 12th. Cost is $75, 70 if you paid in full by March 4th. Fill out a form in the church foyer and sign up or visit the website at vranch.org. We also have rent a teen rent a teen starts on Saturday, March 26th from 8 to 2 p.m. Next-gen students are starting their fundraising for camp this year. If you need help with yard work, housework, and other tasks, be sure to sign up to the Welcome Center for rent a team. Your donation will help the students go to camp. E-Waste Drop-Off is on Saturday, March 26th from 9 to 12 p.m. Drop-Off TVs, monitors, cords, and wires, and more. We also have our Peru mission trip coming up. Join our Peru mission trip team for one week from June 16th to the 25th. The total cost is $1,400. Talk to us about fundraising. Contact David at dmcjt at yahoo.com for more information. We also have our welcome card. If you're new here today and are interested in getting more connected, fill out the welcome card and turn it in to the welcome desk. We'll meet you there to get to know you and get you a free welcome gift. Thank you. Well, if you have your Bible, open to the book of Psalms. And open to Psalm 23, the book of Psalms, Psalm 23. Going to read a Psalm of David, and we're going to start in verse 1. Psalm 23, a very familiar Psalm. David says, The Lord is my shepherd, I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters, he renews my life, he leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word and time to worship. I pray that I would decrease, you increase. May you speak to our hearts and to our minds, not just for information, but for transformation. To give us hope and make us more like Jesus. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the things that we all hope for is that God will take good care of us as his children, as followers of Jesus. Psalm 23 is known as one of these 
category of psalms of confidence. I read one earlier from Psalm 16. They are intended to give us confidence in the promises of God. And when we have confidence in the promises of God, we can have hope. And the context of Psalm 23 is the, this idea of God caring for his sheep. We are often called sheep in Scripture. We need a shepherd. And Psalm 23 tells us how God takes good care of us and how we can hope for those things. And this is probably, uh, arguably, the most well-known of all the Psalms. It seems like almost every person knows this Psalm, whether they are religious or Christian or anything like that. Many a funeral has had Psalm 23 spoken into it and a part of that. And it's a great psalm to memorize because uh, its lines speak of how God cares for us in the various different ways that he does, especially as we're going through the storms of life or as he talks about going through these valleys of the shadows of death, these dark, dark places especially in the times of extreme loss. And we, when we feel like and often wonder, does God really care for us? And he uses, David does, these great word pictures to, to give us these metaphors and these similes to be able to picture what, what God is and what God does and how God functions in relation to taking care of us and providing for our very needs. And the beauty of it is, is, is wonderful to do and to be a part of and to truly understand and embrace. And we can have hope for God's care in our lives. And that's what we want to talk about in our time together. The question is why? Why? Can we have hope for God's care in our lives? So I just want to use some because statements to kind of explain that and talk to this psalm here in our time together. It's because we have hope and because we have a personal relationship with God. The Bible, it opens up, it's right there, Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I have what I need so who's your shepherd? The Lord. You know, Jesus talks about this in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. So when David says, and when we say the Lord is my shepherd, we are saying that Jesus is is Lord of our lives. He is the leader of our lives. He is the guiding one of our lives. He provides for us. He protects us. And he's willing to sacrifice, and he was willing to sacrifice himself for us. That is what a shepherd did. A shepherd was not a position that was given much stance in the world of the time. They were dirty. It was a dirty job. It was a never-ending job to try and keep the sheep in, and, and the shepherd was the one who cared, but he did hire people sometimes to be able to help him to round all of these, these sheep up, depending on the size of the herd. But they didn't care for the sheep as much as them because they didn't own them. They didn't know them. They were just hired to do a job, and that's a much different thinking about that. And, and, and you know, for, for pastors, we are called pastors, and the, the basic meaning of being a pastor is a shepherd. We're more than just hirelings. We are appointed by God to be under shepherds, to the shepherd, who is Jesus himself. We want Jesus to lead us not only in our church, but we want Jesus to lead us in our own lives. We want his direction. We want his leadership. We want his 
provision. We want his protection. And his is the sacrifice that the only, is the only one that really matters. And quite frankly, folks, that's what gives us hope in life. That's what gives us hope in life. The Lord is my shepherd. We can have hope of his care because we are God's sheep. We are God's child. And he loves us. And he cares for us deeper than we can even possibly fathom or understand in this world today. We can have hope for God's care because he provides good nourishment for us. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. The shepherd's job was to make sure that the sheep were to have everything that they needed in order to thrive and to prosper for the herd, for for them to do all those things that, that they did with sheep. They were to lack nothing. That was the shepherd's job. They should always have enough to eat. They should always have enough to drink. They should always be able to go to good places in order to do those things. The Lord is our shepherd. He takes us to good places. He's the one who lets us lie down in green pastures. He's the one who leads us besides quiet waters. He's the one who does all of that. This doesn't mean that we get everything that we desire. We often define God loving us in that way. Well, I want this. I didn't get it, so God must not like me. That is not how it works. God is our shepherd, is the one leading, guiding us, and directing us. He knows what's best for us. He knows what's what's good for us. And he knows some of the things that we may desire the most are the least for us. But everything that God says we need is what we need in order to survive and to thrive. Why? Because he is the shepherd. He knows us. He knows you. He knows me. Sheep are very interesting animals, not exactly the smartest animals in God's creation. And they, they like to eat and then lie down to digest their food. The way their digestive system works, it functioned better that way they, so that they could what they call ruminate on their food. We get the phrase ruminate. Let me ruminate on these things. Basically means let me go think about them for a while. They like to eat and then lie down. The thing about that is that sheep won't do that. And get the picture here. Sheep will not do that if they're hungry. Sheep will not do that if they are in fear of predators. And sheep are, won't do that if they are not getting along with other sheep around them. And that is quite a picture. There is so much that can be unpacked in that picture. If they're hungry, they won't lie down. They have nothing to ruminate on. They need to go look for food. They need to stand to eat. If they sense wolves in their midst, they won't lie down. They may eat, but they won't lie down. And when they can't lie down, they run into problems. They don't digest their food well, when they're having issues with other sheep. Now, I personally have never seen sheep fight with one another, but I'm assuming that they can in some way, shape, or form. They are animals after all. But when they are in fear and they can't get along with others within their own family, their own herd, they won't lie down in green pastures. It's a picture In our lives, it's a picture in the life of the church, a life amongst God's people. The picture David gives us is one of well-fed sheep that are content and lying down to ruminate on their food because the shepherd has fully cared for them. The shepherd is there making sure that they're in a great place to eat, 
He's there knowing and watching and making sure that they don't feel threatened by any competitor, by predators around them. And he's also making sure that they're all being nice to one another so that they can enjoy the picture. Everybody can lie down in green pastures. That's what the shepherd does. Now, some of you may be saying, so what? What's the big deal about that? Nice picture. Well, here's the deal. God feeds us spiritual food from his word. That's what we're to do. We keep wanting God to supply for those felt needs that we have in our lives, and, and I, we all certainly understand it. If you're hungry, you're hungry. If you need clothes, you need clothes. But ultimately, God is interested in our spiritual health, vitality, and growth amongst, any, amongst or better than everything else. And God feeds us spiritual food from His Word. That's why we preach and teach the Bible. It's His Word. It is living it is active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It's what gives us hope and meaning and purpose. It is what's good for rebuking and correcting and training up in righteousness, according to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And so as we are receiving our spiritual food from God himself, when his word comes back into our minds, what do we do? We are to ruminate on it. Put ourselves in a place to be able to take it in and digest what it says and figure out what it means for our lives and let God speak to us and not have to be in fear of all those things around us in order for that to take place. And then once it becomes a part of who we are, that means we can apply it to our lives. And that's the whole goal of, of the Bible. We, we need to read the Bible. We need to get the food of the Word. The Bible also calls it the milk. And as we grow in Christ, we're supposed to move from milk to solid food. That's part of growing in Christ and maturing. But you've got to do that by starting with it. You ruminate on it. You figure out how to apply it to our lives. And when it applies to our lives, then it becomes a part of who we are and what we become. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, according to Galatians 5, and 23. Those, those become a part of who we are because the Spirit is in us. Our Word has told us we understand what these things mean and we apply them to our lives. And we should want to do that. John 4, 34, Jesus says, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work, Jesus told them. Jesus had this great uncanny knack of saying when people thought he was hungry, I'm not hungry for that. What I am hungry for, I get from my Father. And as I ruminate on that, I go out and do what he says. Remember, Jesus said he didn't do anything of his own. He said he only did what the Father told him to do. Oh, that we could get there. Isn't that the goal? To do only what the Father wants us to to do, to do his will. He provides these things. The shepherd provides these things for us. He leads us to green pastures. He leads us to quiet waters. He restores our souls. See, not only do sheep need food, but they need water. Not only do we need food, we need water. We need the word spiritually. Here the sheep can drink and be refreshed, and the shepherd can wash them, and he can clean any wounds that they may have. Again, a great picture of, of how we're to, to minister to one another and to care for one another as we ruminate on his word, as he takes us to these clean streams of water so that we can be refreshed and we can be washed and have our wounds healed. You see, folks, at times our souls do need to be refreshed. I mean, let's just be honest. We go hard at it now in our world today. We are, we are motivated and, and run by these little square things that we carry in our hands called phones. 
They have calendars in them, but all somebody has to do is to text us on that same phone in which we hold our calendar, and our life can change immediately. We run at the behest of these things, and boom, and our days are filled and filled, and every time, it seems like everybody I talk to people, they say these two things all the time. Hey, how you doing today, Joe? I'm busy. Or, how you doing today, Jane? I'm tired. It isn't amazing how those go right in to one another. That, there's people too many. We're running on ragged. We're running around all the time. We're, we're having a hard time finding time to find time to have our souls refreshed to come by the streams of clean water. And when we struggle, we crave when we strayed, when we neglect our spiritual selves, when we don't allow the shepherd to do those things in our lives that, that he promises that he will do, as David tells us in this psalm, like the Lord is my shepherd, I shall have what I need. Lie down in green pastures. Take me to quiet waters. Renew my life. That's what water does. It's amazing how good you feel after you have an ice-cold glass of water. We long for being refreshed when we're exhausted. And we live in a world today where we allow it to exhaust us and we struggle. We yearn to have our souls refreshed when we're in difficult and confusing times. And has anything been more difficult and confusing than these last two plus years in our country, in our world? In our community, we get strung out, burned out. We start having trouble ruminating. Even if we're eating, we're like the the sheep who stands because they're afraid of what's going on around them or afraid of what might happen to them. Afraid of what their neighbor might say about them. Afraid of what a church member thinks of them and we allow all these things to just blast into our heads over and over and over again and we become spiritually exhausted and confused. The shepherd doesn't want that for our lives. He doesn't want it for your life. He doesn't want it for my life. So we have to trust and hope and we know this is true. God cares for us. Why? Because he's our shepherd. He knows what we need. He takes us to green pastures. He wants us to lie down beside quiet waters. And he puts us in places to do that. Jesus must lead us, folks, in order for us to feel restored and renewed. See, sheep have this weird thing. They, they, they chose not to follow often. <laughs> And when they didn't follow the shepherd, they would often stray off. And they, what they would not find is they wouldn't find a clean place to go drink water. They'd often find a dirty place to find water. You see, when we tend to lead ourselves, we tend to gravitate towards these more unsatisfying and, dare I say, these more polluted pools. Like the sheep who try and lead themselves, we who try and lead ourselves, we tend to not take ourselves to the places where God, our shepherd, wants us to go. We we find them not fun, unfulfilling, boring. And yet the world and its dirty pools leaves us desperately unsatisfied, exhausted, and seeking something more. But we can have hope. God cares for us. He leads us to refreshing waters. He renews our life. He leads us in the right direction. That's what he says. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his namesake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, or you may have walked through the valley of the shadow of death, which is tend to be a metaphor for a darkest valley, I fear no danger. I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We're sheep. We all know our lives. 
You've been a Christian for any length of time, you know you need the shepherd to lead. We know that when we don't, our lives tend to go in a direction that we didn't think was right. God knows this. We need to understand the image here. Isaiah 53, 6, that passage about the suffering of Christ, it says this, We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned on our, to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Because we liked dirty pools, because we chose not to listen to the shepherd, Jesus had to be punished and die on the cross in our place. So that we could finally ultimately get to that place of refreshing and still water and have our life renewed. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, very familiar Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways know him or acknowledge him, depending on your translation, and he will make your paths straight. That's a promise. You trust and he will make your path straight. All of us like a straight line. At least we say we do. When we follow the shepherd, he'll get us along that road. When we don't, and we follow for these dangerous oases of polluted water. We run into trouble. We can trust in the care of God and hope in the care of God because he is with us in the dark valleys. I read it already. See, David switches from talking about God and now he starts talking to, do, to God. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. This sudden change in verse 4. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, God is with us through the darkest of valleys. The most troubling of times. In the deepest pits of our despair, God is with us. God comforts us. When we face death, death in all of its various forms of life, the death of a loved one, God's there. Death of a job, a loss of a job, God's there. Death of a dream, God's there. The death of our sin in our lives that keeps us in the valley, God's there. He leads us. He's there with us. The Bible tells us that God says he will never leave us nor forsake us. I wish we could understand that and live better that way. We would live better that way if we could embrace that truth in our lives. See, knowing, well, Psalm 56.3 says, When I am afraid, I will trust in you. Oftentimes when we are afraid, even for many followers of Christ, they will trust in themselves. Fear makes us look to self. It's just a, a seemingly natural instinct to forget God. He doesn't know anything. I know more. I'm the one in danger. I'm the one in fear. I'm the one who needs to protect himself. And that's just the lousiest place to be, especially when you're a sheep. A sheep without a shepherd to guide and protect them against the predators of this world, against the predators in this world for real sheep in, our li in the world we see today, is bad news. They got no shot against a wolf. And without our Lord and without the Spirit, we have no shot in this world. Knowing that Jesus is with us and helps us deal with these fears and the things we do not understand, and so we learn not to be afraid. We embrace his spirit in us. We learn to embrace that he loves us. He loves us. He loves us. We don't need to be afraid. 1 John 4, 18. 
There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. John's very straightforward here. The perf- one who gives perfect love is God, our shepherd. If you love, you don't need to fear. If you know God loves you, you don't need to fear. You don't need to fear punishment. So many Christians I know today, so many people, they, they just fear punishment. I'm like, you don't need to fear punishment. That's what Jesus died in your place for. So the one who fears is not completed. You're not mature. It's a spiritual growth thing. I get it. I always get joked about it a lot because I like to give moms a hard time for about their constant worriedness and anxiety. I just read what God says, and I just read the Bible, and it says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Try and tell a mom that. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Try and tell a mom that. We shouldn't have anxiety. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Pray. Trust in him. He's with us. And I don't know where you're at in life today. I don't, you may be at a pretty low point as you're watching this, and I don't know where you're at with that. And I pray you're not, but you may be. But just trust what God says when he says you're not alone. He's with you. He'll get you through the valley. See, the implication of a valley is that you get out of it. you got to get out of a valley, right? If you keep traveling, moving forward, progressing on in life, eventually, I mean, you're going from a peak, you got to go down into a valley, and when you go into a valley, eventually that valley turns into something you've got to ascend and climb up to get to the other side, to the mountain on the other side. The key is to keep moving forward through the valley. God never says we won't have them. Nowhere in Psalm 23 do you read that there are no dark valleys or shadows of death. Life just doesn't work that way. But what he does say is he's with you. So don't be afraid. And do not fear. We can know he cares for us and hope in his care because he comforts us. I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David found comfort in the tools of the shepherd, the rod, and the staff. The rod was used to protect the sheep from its enemies. That was his his weapon against the wolves and whatever else was coming along. He also used it to discipline the sheep when they weren't getting along and not listening to what he says. He also used it to count the sheep. It was a way when he was coming to the gate, he'd put his staff up and he'd count the sheep going underneath his staff and he'd make a count to make sure he had all the sheep that were left in his charge. God knows the name of every single one of his children, of his sheep. And he won't leave you out there by yourself. So what can we take from that? We can take comfort knowing that God will protect us. We can take comfort knowing that God will discipline us. And he will. I don't wish God's wood shed on anybody, but sometimes we just like to put ourselves in there, don't we? Amen? That's a sign of his love for us. Discipline is not punishment. We need to quit thinking that way. He brings us back if we go astray. We know the parable that Jesus said that the shepherd left the 99 to find the one. And that one could be every single one of us. He knows us, He tends to our needs. He tends to our wounds. The staff was used to support and help and 
manage the, ste- the, the sheep. Uh, we can take comfort in these things and how we use it to kind of put them in line and to, to do all those things. We can take comfort in knowing that God will guide us out of danger. He'll rescue us when we fall. He'll care for the young and the weak. And he'll draw us close to him. That's a promise that God gives us. We can take hope in his care because he will honor us and give us much blessing in the presence of our enemies. This is a very interesting little little tidbit here. You're you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. David uses, changes metaphors here is what he does. And he talks about one of a lavish host honoring a guest in the banquet. And the picture here is of the, 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 the host making this huge party. And the only thing around him are his enemies. And so for David, his point is this. David's enemies see him as being honored. Why? Because they know that he is under the host, and that's God's protection. David's got your, he says, God's got my back. He's blessing me in the presence of my enemies. Isn't that a truth that's great? In the midst of the chaos And all the nonsense that we deal with in our world today, you may have going on in your own life. The enemies that may be swirling around in your head and in your life. God is there with you, honoring you and protecting you because you're under his protection. It shows the generosity of God by talking about this anointing the head with oil. That was a major thing to do in the culture of the time. It was valuable. shows that the host had an overflowing supply to bless those that were in his protection and to honor them. And God blesses us beyond what we are able or even possibly to truly think about. And we're blessed to be a blessing to others. Many of us oftentimes question whether or not God has truly blessed us, and I don't think we can rightfully say that if we look back in our lives and be honest with ourselves. God has been way, way above and beyond good to me, giving me much more than I ever, ever could deserve. We can have hope in God's care be and goodness and mercy and faithful love will pursue us. Look at what he says. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. Hmm. The picture here is that David's no longer being chased by enemies, or even if he is, it's something more important that's pursuing him. Instead of being chased by enemies, he's now being pursued by God himself and being pursued by the goodness and mercy of God. The Lord's goodness and mercy follows us because the Lord pours it out on us and we pour it out on others. Again, we're blessed to be a blessing. We're blessed because God's house is our home. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord for as long as I live, or you may have in the house of the Lord forever. David was blessed because he knew in the midst of the valleys and the storms that he had a shepherd who loved him and cared for him. That was never going to leave him. That was always going to be there for him. And David was hardly perfect. We looked at that last week. Yet he was a man after God's own heart. I think because he understood how to relate to God. How to love God. 
even in the midst of his own frailties and in the midst of the numerous storms that he held to deal with in his life. Some of them brought on by others, a lot of them brought on by his own decisions that he made. You know, Jesus gave us a promise in John 14, and it's an all promise again that we often use along with Psalm 23 in, in times of, of loss of loved ones. He says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. But now I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. The great part about the shepherd that leads us, guides us, protects us, provides for us is it's not only for this life. Jesus promised to us that gives us hope is that He's got something building for us right now in the place that we all want to go. The place that's with him forever. Because the goal for every follower of Jesus is to be where he is. Because only there is peace, love, and perfect happiness. Hope comes and stays with us even when we remember, reflect, and trust that he loves us and cares for us. His desire for us is to worship Him in this world and in the world to come as He cares for us now in this life. Very quickly in our time we have left, I want us to read from Psalm. I want to read Psalm 121 to you. Just to encourage you. I encourage you now to just close your eyes and Put yourself in an attitude of prayer and just let me read this psalm to you. My Bible calls it the title of it, The Lord, Our Protector. It says, I lift my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. The Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter right by your side. The sun will not strike you by day or the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all harm. He will protect your life. The Lord will protect your coming and going, both now and forever. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's his promise. And we can have hope. Father, thank you for this wonderful psalm that speaks to the depths of our very souls. Lord, help us to find confidence in your presence, your protection, your provision, and your power. As we walk through this life, as you lead us and guide us and discipline us and take us to green pastures so that we can ruminate on your word and your presence, as you take us to clean, still waters to refresh us and revive our very souls, as you lead us and guide us. And we look forward to that day when we are truly in the house of the Lord forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this week. I pray you have a blessed week. We look forward to seeing you next time here at First Baptist Church of Have a great week, everybody.